Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is Tend to Life and we talk all things true crime here. So welcome and thank you for checking out the channel if you haven't done so before. The case we are talking about today, guys, it is like a whirlwind. There is so much information out there and it's being released daily, hourly. So there are so many videos about this case that it really has made it hard to keep things straight and to be able to follow it and know exactly what's going on. So because of that, I have now made a video where it takes us through the entire case start to finish. Well, I shouldn't say finish, but to current as of where we are right now. But because there is so much information and so many twists and suspects and craziness in this case, it is going to be a long one. So buckle up here, guys, because we're going to be hanging out for quite some time this morning. Early in the morning on Saturday, May 28th, 2022, Karen Rounds made a customary call to her grandson, 19-year-old Dylan. Dylan and his grandmother usually speak a few times a week and have a pretty close relationship. When Dylan answered the phone, he told his grandmother that he couldn't talk right then and he would have to call her back. He quickly explained that it was about to rain and he needed to get his seed truck inside. You see, Dylan wasn't like most 19-year-olds. In fact, Dylan has more direction and drive in his life than most adults do. Even though he isn't even in his early 20s yet, Dylan owns and runs his own farm in Elucin, Utah, which is a very remote city in Utah. When his grandmother hung up the phone, she would have had no way of knowing that that would be the last time she or anyone in their family would speak to Dylan. When he didn't return his grandmother's phone call as promised, she started to become worried. She was the first to ask the question that is now on everybody's mind, where is Dylan Rounds? So guys, let's get right into it. Tend to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. When I first heard about this case, I thought it was going to be a pretty cut and dry missing persons case. I really wanted to bring awareness to the fact that a young man just mysteriously vanished from his farm and help the family get the exposure that they need for their son. However, the more I have looked into this case, and which with each passing day, really, the information surrounding Dylan's disappearance has become weirder and weirder, to be honest. The two cities that play a part in this case are extremely small, and as most of us know, nothing usually goes unnoticed in a small town. So there have been many allegations made, many rumors spread, secrets uncovered, and sketchy behavior by many of the people involved, which has now made it pretty hard to sift through and uncover the actual proven facts. I'm going to try my best to stick with the timeline that has been verified and the things that can actually be proven before discussing anything else. But all I'm going to say, guys, is this case is taking a direction that I don't think anyone would have expected. Most 19-year-olds are just starting college or going out into the world on their own. They are figuring out who they are, what they want to do with their lives, who they want to be. But Dylan Rounds was different. He has known what he has wanted to do since he was a baby, and that was to farm. It was his dream to have his own farm and to produce his own crops. His mother has said that Dylan knew how to drive a tractor before most children even knew how to ride a bike. Dylan was born in Idaho to his parents Candace and Justin. He has a younger brother and sister, but after a tumultuous marriage, Candace and Justin divorced by the time Dylan was just four years old. Even though their relationship had been described by some as volatile, they were able to co-parent their children together for the most part and keep things somewhat peaceful. There has been some speculation that when Candace got remarried to her husband, Mike, she may have spent some time away from her children, which caused their relationship to be strained and for them to become closer with their paternal grandparents, Karen and Larry Rounds. Regardless, they must have done something right because their son, Dylan, turned out to be a very well-rounded young man. Farming is in his blood, and he has been learning and preparing to start his own farm pretty much his entire life. He was extremely hardworking and dedicated to succeeding at his goal of producing his own crops. Dylan's grandparents helped him bring his dream to fruition by either purchasing land for or with their grandson over in that small town of Lucin, Utah. Many people doubted Dylan and told him that there was no way he would ever get a crop in the arid landscape of Lucin, 
but he was determined, and Dylan and his grandparents got a pretty great deal on this 640-acre lot that they purchased, and that is because nobody else really wants to live out there. It is out in the middle of nowhere. The land is literally dirt cheap because it is so isolated and the environment is really desert land. Being only 162 miles from Salt Lake City, the soil in Lucen is very alkaline and covered in sagebrush. So farming in this condition would pose a challenge to any seasoned farmer, but Dylan was determined to prove that he could do it. At 16 years old, Dylan, with the help of his grandfather Larry and various farmhands, began the huge project of preparing the land for actual farming. All of the brush needed to be pulled out, the soil prepared properly, not to mention gathering all of the needed equipment that it takes to run a successful farm. It was a huge task, but one that Dylan was very passionate about. Lucen is a city located in Box Elder County, Utah, right near the border of the neighboring state, Nevada. Lucen was an abandoned railroad ghost town until it slowly started being resettled, as recently as 2007. The type of people who would be interested in living in Lucen are people who would want to be off the grid. Some anti-government people, those looking for cheap land to farm, just people who really kind of want to stay off the radar. And in every city of the world, there are good and there are bad people. We know that. And the surrounding cities often describe people in Lucen as either farmers, squatters, or drug users. Obviously, that's a pretty harsh generalization, and I know that the bigger that this case has gotten, the more offended the citizens of Lucen are becoming because of that speculation and judgment. While it's true that there are sketchy, transient people in the desert there, drug labs in some of the old mines, theft issues, and things like that, there are people who just like to be away from the rest of the world. So yes, there is possibility of sketchy, shady behavior, but there's also people who really do just want to be off the grid and they're not up to anything. There are even people actually doing conservation work out there and even raising alpacas on sanctuary farms because Lucent and its landscape really is their natural habitat. There are some people who were hoping to bring more visitors to this tiny, unique place to see the remains of this ghost town, the alpacas, and the beautiful region. One of the most popular, if not the only popular attraction to Lucent is an art installation that was built there in 1976 by an artist named Nancy Holt. And people do come out to this isolated land to see the huge and carefully arranged cement tunnels that are built to view the rising and setting of the summer and winter solstice. There are also holes in the tunnels that perfectly reflect the pattern of constellations in the sun and even in the moonlight. So again, while it's true that there are some people who are better left alone out there, there definitely is a beauty in Lucen, and it's loved by a handful of its residents. Now that I've explained to you the setting and where this entire case starts to form and take place, let's go back to Dylan. After years of prepping and getting the farm ready and laying down some roots out there, Dylan was finally going to have his first crop this year of feed and grain for the farm animals. On his land, the farm itself and where he was sleeping and staying at night were actually about five miles apart. There were hookups for RVs and well water set up in one area, and then in the area he was farming was further away. There he had a barn and all of his farming equipment like tractors, a huge truck that held seed or grain in the back, backhoes, and his mother said that he had built a pond out there as well. Dylan stayed in an RV at the hookup area alongside the RV of one of his farmhands. It's a little unclear, but I believe various farmhands lived in their RVs near Dylan at some point or another as well. His mother had said that during the off-season, he would come back to their hometown in Idaho about three hours away and stay with her, his father, and his grandparents. When he wasn't farming, he was back there with his family and seeing his childhood best friend named J.D. Dylan had a Ford truck that he used as a tool for farming, but also as a means to get out of Lucen. If he wasn't going back to his parents, he would drive to the nearest town over the border into Nevada called Montello, located in Elko County. Lucen didn't have a town, per se, so the citizens living there would often travel to Montello or other towns to shop, to eat, to pick up things they needed. Even though it's considered close, it is still a 30-minute drive away from Lucen. When driving by Montello, if you blink, you will miss it. It is only a few blocks and really only has two restaurants called the Cowboy Bar and the Saddlesore Bar, and then a post office. It is tiny. 
the population of Montello is less than 100 people. So you can imagine that everybody knows everybody. Literally my worst nightmare. Dylan would frequently go to Montello to grab a burger, to see some of his buddies that he had made, and his mother said that he would often stay in Montello if he was there late because the drive was absolutely no fun at night, even though it was just 30 minutes. So Dylan had a cool little setup out there for himself. And you know what they say, do what you love and you will never work a day in your life. I believe that's how Dylan felt as well, because he truly just loved to work from sun up to sundown. His parents have said that all he had talked about was farming and how excited he was to have his first crop this year. At one point, Dylan had help on the farm from men named Kurt, Jim, and one of his grandfather's friends, Don. These men are all much older than Dylan, and as you can imagine, probably weren't too thrilled about taking orders from a 19-year-old. But Jim took this in stride, and Kurt actually became one of Dylan's good friends, even though there was a big age difference, because Kurt was in his early 60s. Dylan has been described as an old soul, not of his generation, and they apparently had a lot in common. Plus, there probably weren't too many people Dylan's age to be friends with out there anyway. However, Dylan's mom explains that a few months back, he and Don got into a disagreement about what work Dylan should be prioritizing. After arguing, the two decided to go their separate ways, and Don wouldn't be working on the farm any longer. Even without Don's help, Dylan kept trucking along and plugging away on his farm as usual. On Thursday, May 26th, due to bank statements and witnesses, we know that Dylan was again in Montello, perhaps getting something to eat from the saddle sore or picking something up. People have claimed to see him there on Friday as well, which wouldn't be unusual because he often stayed the night in town as I mentioned. Everything was normal up until that Saturday, the 28th, when he had that phone call from his grandmother. Like I said before, on the phone he told her he would call her later because he had to get his seed truck inside since it was about to rain. Dylan's truck was filled with seed, and if they got wet, he ran the risk of the seeds sprouting prematurely or even molding. So Dylan definitely wouldn't allow anything to happen to those seeds, and the truck did get backed into the barn that day. On Sunday, Dylan's grandmother started to become a little concerned that he had not called her back yet. Most people might wonder why worry if it had only been one day. If you think about the isolation, though, of Lucen and all of the heavy machinery that Dylan worked with, as well as the snakes, the coyotes in the area, it's easy to see why anybody would worry about a family member out there, let alone a 19-year-old kid. Dylan's grandmother called and asked Don and Jim to go check on him and to make sure that everything was okay. When they arrived at the farm and looked back at his RV, they didn't find Dylan, but they weren't too concerned because, again, he could have been in Montello. Even though he wasn't answering his phone, Don and Jim waited until Monday to let his grandmother know that they weren't able to locate Dylan. His grandmother called Dylan's best friend, JD, to ask if he had spoken to him, and when JD relayed that he hadn't, she started to get even more worried. JD then called Candace, Dylan's mother, to ask if she had spoken to him and was sort of surprised to hear that Candace wasn't even aware that nobody had heard from her son. Candace has said in interviews that while she talks to him weekly, it wasn't any big deal to go a few days without speaking to Dylan. He was always in contact with her, his dad, or his grandparents, but not necessarily on the same day. Candace called her ex-husband, Dylan's dad Justin, and the two of them got together to drive to Dylan's farm to see if they could locate their son. On the drive there, Candace phoned the Box Elder Police Department, the county where Lucen is located, and filed a missing persons report. When Dylan's family arrived at their son's farm, they saw that his seed truck was in the barn like he told his grandmother he was going to do. His Ford truck was back where his camper was, and it was locked. Parents were unable to find the key fob for his truck, so they waited until the Box Elder Police and the search and rescue personnel arrived to get into it and see if they could find anything else. Only 90 minutes into the search for Dylan, something was found that made Candace and Justin's heart sink to the pit of their stomach. Imagine how horrified you would feel if your child was missing, and the first thing that you find is the one thing you know for an absolute fact your child would never willingly leave without. For Dylan, that was his boots. Candace and the people who know him have explained that Dylan is a predictable creature of habit. He liked what he liked, and he didn't switch things up, ever. She said that ever since he was three years old, he has had the same kind of boots, and he would wear them until they were worn out and then get a new pair the exact same. 
She even said that on her fireplace at her home, she uses his boots from three years old to now as a decoration to show the progression of his feet, which I think is actually a really cute idea. And I would love to do that with my little Theodore. But anyway, he didn't wear any other shoes and he didn't even own any other shoes. So when the searches located Dylan's boots behind a mound of dirt 100 yards away from his barn, they knew that something was seriously wrong and that this wasn't just a missing persons case. They knew their son would never go anywhere without his boots and wouldn't just wander off into the desert shoeless. In most missing person cases, the police ask if the person might have wanted to go somewhere. Were they seeing anyone? Were they angry about anything? But Dylan's parents explained that their son was different. He wasn't interested in having a girlfriend or partying or screwing around. He was interested in farming. He had no problems with anyone, and he wasn't unhappy. In fact, he was the exact opposite. He was elated that he had finally gotten his first crop, and he would never just walk away from his farm that he had worked so hard to create and to come to fruition. On one of the boots, the police spotted a blood-like stain and placed them in the patrol car to be tested for evidence. And they told Dylan's parents that they needed to keep the boots to use for the cadaver dog search. While trying to rack their brains about anything that they could think of that would help find their son, Candace remembered a conversation that she had with her son a few days prior on Wednesday, May 25th. She remembers that he called and told her, Mom, you're never going to believe this. When I was driving, a man just came out of nowhere in the desert, covered in blood with no shoes on. He asked to use my phone and for a ride, but I only let him use my phone and then I left him there. Which I have to just say, like, if that isn't a testament to Dylan's character, I don't know what is. Because I, you know, as good of a person as I would like to think that I am, if I saw somebody walking with no shoes on, covered in blood that looked a little sketchy, I don't know that I would let them use my phone. I think I'd be a little freaked out. But Dylan allowed him to use his phone. He said that the man wanted a ride to Montello, but he said no and he left him there. But Candace, not knowing if the man would have anything to do with her son being missing or not, they moved on to more options and kept the search going. There were hundreds of people out searching for Dylan, but at this point, none of Dylan's property was being considered as a crime scene. The next day on Tuesday, May 31st, Candace received a phone call from Kurt, one of the men who used to work with Dylan and who had become his friend, that 60-year-old man. Kurt also happens to own the saddle sore bar in Montello that Dylan frequented. And he told Candace that a man by the name of Chase Venstra was the guy who Dylan had run into in the desert that Wednesday prior, and that Chase and another man were holding Dylan hostage at a house in Montello. So Candace immediately called the Box Elder County Police and told them what she had just heard about her son. They told her that because Chase was supposedly in Montello, which was Nevada, that they needed to call the Elko Police because it was now their jurisdiction. When Candace called the Elko police, she realized that the Box Elder Police Department hadn't even told the Elko police about her son being missing, and they had no clue what she was talking about when she told them that her son was being held hostage. She also pointed out that in general, the family had been feeling alone and left to their own devices to search for Dylan, because most of the time, apparently the police department wasn't even there to help. When Elko was finally clued in as to what was going on, they searched and cleared the home where Chase was allegedly holding Dylan hostage. Kurt never explained who told him that information, though, and nothing else was really said about it at all. And I find this so odd, because if you get a tip that somebody's being held hostage as a law enforcement officer or human being, wouldn't the first thing be to talk to that person and say, how do you know that information? Who told you that? you know, not just where the house is located, but how did you come to know of this? I don't know, something weird, but we're going to keep going and talk about things a little bit more here. Even though the home was cleared, Dylan's parents still felt that Chase was a person of interest, or at least knew something about their son. Chase wanted to clear his name, so much so that he actually called the police department several times to try and provide an alibi, but they wouldn't answer his calls. Finally, he decided to call Candace herself and told her that he had nothing to do with a Dylan. Chase actually ended up being picked up by police and is now in jail on unrelated charges. Which I find crazy. If he was trying to clear himself, even knowing that he could get picked up on unrelated charges and they weren't talking to him, why? Why not try to rule every single suspect out? It's weird. 
With the family feeling desperate for answers about their son, they hired several private plane and helicopter pilots to search for Dylan by air. They even got the huge YouTubers, the Diesel Brothers, to help out in the search as well. They had the pond near Dylan's farm drained, and still no one had found any signs of Dylan or any clues of any kind anywhere. They were able to sign into another phone using Dylan's information, but found nothing in his texts or his apps. With the key fob to Dylan's truck still being missing, his parents decided to break the back window to gain entry inside to check for his wallet, his phone, or any other clues that were missing or could possibly be there. While outside of the truck, Candace and Justin noticed something they hadn't paid attention to before. The truck had clearly been pressure washed, and this is a huge red flag because Dylan never washed his truck. Like I said before, he used his truck as a tool and was just not interested in washing it or keeping it clean because in the desert, it would just get dirty again almost instantly. In the rain and with water, the dirt kicked up from the ground and it turned into like a cement-like consistency. So Dylan would never have washed his truck, especially when it was going to rain that day anyway. Everything was clean on the exterior besides the wheel wells, which led his parents to believe that his truck was elsewhere and someone drove it back to his house and pressure washed it with the pressure washer he had there to use on the farm. And this theory was heightened when Candace entered the truck and noticed that she didn't have to move the seat up. She explained that every time she has ever needed to drive Dylan's truck, she would have to scoot the seat way up to reach the steering wheel because she is only 4'11 and Dylan is 5'11. When she got into the truck, the seat was already pushed all the way up. She also said that Dylan had been complaining that his four-wheel drive was broken, yet it was turned on. Only someone who didn't know that the four-wheel drive was broken would have turned it on and tried to use it. Since they had broken the window out of the truck, the family didn't want to just leave it there and have the possibility of it getting filled with sand or stolen, so they asked the police if they could drive it home. The police told Candace to do what they needed to do. <laughs> God, can you believe that? So they took Dylan's truck back home to Idaho without processing the vehicle or examining it for evidence themselves. On Monday, June 6th, his parents asked police what was going on with Dylan's boots. Had they processed it? Had they found anything out? And the police had to admit that his boots were still in the back of that patrol car and that they hadn't even been admitted into evidence, tested, or anything in over a week. Can you believe that? Candace also points out that cadaver dogs don't even need to use someone's personal items for a scent because they look for the scent of decomposition, not always just the scent of that person. So obviously, there was extreme frustration toward the box elder police. But thankfully, on June 10th, they were able to get in with the Elko Police Department and go over the case from top to bottom, which took more than five hours. Dylan's parents felt better now that Elko was on the case and providing their resources, and it was decided to then classify Dylan's case as criminal and not just as a missing person. Dylan's mother, Candace, has been the face of this investigation and has gone on every outlet that she can to tell the story of her son. She has tried to bring awareness and is putting on a brave face, but you can tell that she really just wants answers. There is some speculation that Dylan's father, Justin's side of the family, don't really like how Candace is taking charge and they feel as though not enough has been done to find their grandson. The grandparents, as well as Justin's sister, Dylan's Aunt Katie, hired a PI to help find information out about this case. And this is where the story starts to get a little hairy. And I hate, that sounds gross, but this is where things start to get a little twisted and gets a little messy. Up until now, the timeline of events has been verified, but no one can say what happened to Dylan and what is going on. The PI, James Terry, he goes by Jim, but I'm going to just call him James so we don't get confused with the Jim who was working with Dylan. He was able to talk to people in Montello and Lucen and actually found out that as all of this was taking place, Chase Venstra, that guy who wanted to call the police and give an alibi and who was apparently holding him hostage, all of this stuff, was 300 miles away at a pizza restaurant. But it's also been proven that Dylan lied to his mom and actually did give Chase a ride from the desert to Montello. But the PI has video surveillance from the pizza place that has Chase so far away, so that has cleared him of any involvement. 
but why lie to your mom about seeing somebody covered in blood, letting them use your phone, but not giving them a ride? If you're going to lie about it, why even mention that story at all? James Terry, like Candace, has been making the rounds on a lot of podcasts, YouTube channels, and he has said that Justin's side of the family told him to take what Candace says with a massive grain of salt and that she wasn't quite the mother that she is painting herself out to be. Now look, I'm not going to badmouth Dylan's mom or any of his family because at the end of the day, none of us know the truth. And this is about Dylan, not about his messy family, if they even are messy. The information that P.I. James Terry has found, though, is very unsettling. And ever since he started giving information to the family, Candace has wanted to cut ties with him. However, she was not the one who hired James, and other family members are still asking him to help gather information. It seems like there is some strain in the family and how things are being handled. I want to make sure that everybody knows that what P.I. James has said has not yet been proven, and it's ultimately the police's job to charge anyone with anything and to make any arrests. People in the town, though, have told James that Dylan and that 62-year-old friend Kurt were in a relationship, more than just a friendship. Now, I'm not saying this is true or false, but James is alleging that people, including Kurt himself, have said that this is true and that Kurt's wife and one of his daughters even claimed that that's the reason their marriage fell apart, and it's because of these activities relating to cross-dressing and being interested in young men, and that that's the reason that the marriage is falling apart. The next thing that P.I. James said he discovered during his investigation is that Kurt has a brother named Troy, who is a proven stalker and on the registry. Even though the information I'm about to say has yet to be proven by police, James says he has recordings and sources that will prove these allegations, so just keep that in mind. P.I. James said that a woman came forward who was a nurse that took care of three women in the past. She said these three women were held captive in a shed in the desert and forced to do favors for food and water. The women said that their shoes were taken so they could not run away in the desert. Their captor was allegedly Troy. Kurt's brother. And the women were so terrified after they were rescued that they refused to testify against him and moved and just completely changed their names. However, James says that there are police reports and paperwork documenting this, and it's evident that Dylan had been hanging out with Kurt and with Troy. Kurt also has been seen in the last couple of weeks with nail scratches on his arm. The last thing P.I. James said he found out was that Dylan, Kurt, and Troy were policing the desert land in Lucen and Montello. It's actually not uncommon either for areas like that to kind of look out for each other and police themselves, since real police officers are so far away, and in my opinion, apparently aren't doing a great job. Candace, out there, I should say, Clarity, aren't doing a great job out there, given what we know in this case. Candace has even said that since Lucen is so remote and has such a small amount of people, Police kind of just pretend they aren't there and let people take care of themselves. With all of the drug use, though, and theft in this area, it said that some of the men would act as a neighborhood watch of sorts, even though they are just watching the desert land and farming supplies and things like that. Several groups have allegedly come forward saying that they were stopped by men who pulled guns on them in the desert, and this was actually deterring people from camping, hiking, and visiting the area, including those sun tunnels I talked about earlier. It's important to note that Candace and P.I. James have not gotten along and do not agree with each other on the direction to take when looking for Dylan. James has said that he has much more information and will provide proof for those allegations against Kurt and Troy. He suggests that Kurt's phone be looked at to see if there is any indication that he and Dylan did have a relationship. Which I think it is interesting too, as you look at everything, and I know there are a lot of players involved. Kurt's the one who first dropped the bombshell that Dylan was being held hostage by Chase in a shed. That is a pretty big coincidence because we know that there is evidence, according to P.I. James and proof, that his brother Troy previously held people hostage inside a shed. So when you're looking at that, my mind immediately goes to he's telling a half-truth here, but he's pinning it on somebody else. If Chase was 300 miles away, 
regardless if he was covered in blood when he had taken him that Wednesday, whatever, he was 300 miles away at this point. And that was verified through at the pizza place. So if Kurt's saying that Dylan is being held hostage in a shed, but by Chase, could he be trying to truly help Dylan, even if his brother is the one responsible and he wants Dylan to be found because maybe perhaps they were, in fact, in a romantic relationship and he cared for him, but he didn't want to throw his brother under the bus, so he's pinning it on Chase, but still hoping that the cops will search sheds and find him. I don't know. It just seems to me, and tell me what you think, way too much of a coincidence that that is the bombshell he dropped about Chase when that is something that is in his brother's history of behavior and what he has done. The likelihood of that happening and then also have happened happened in your past with somebody related to you is like what? 0.0000000% I don't know it seems fishy one more thing I want to talk about is something that has just come out from several true crime outlets and researchers and that is that there could be some possible money motive attached to all of this like I said earlier I never want to put down any parents who are currently going through the loss of a child or a missing child but I think it would be unfair to cherry pick information that we're sharing when ultimately every piece of the puzzle is going to be vital to finding Dylan. Some citizens of Montello have said that Dylan was recently bragging about having around $30,000 from his grandfather. It's not clear why his grandfather gave him this money, but obviously in Montello and Lucen, banks aren't right around the corner. People out there usually keep their money stashed or in safes or hidden. Could the wrong person have overheard that Dylan had this huge amount of cash on him? There is also evidence showing that he had a $50,000 loan taken out for him from his grandparents as well. At this point, it's not clear where this money is and if it's all accounted for. But many people, including myself, find it strange that Candace hasn't mentioned this money at all, besides saying that he needed money for his farming equipment. From some statements made from Justin's side of the family, They wouldn't have discussed this amount of money with Candace because of the strain in the family towards her. It's also been proven that Candace actually owes nearly $2 million in liens over the past several years. All of this just adds to the confusion and bizarreness of this case. I'm not sure how all of these pieces fit together, but in a small town like that where theft is prevalent, that amount of money would be pretty tempting to some people. And even if he didn't have the cash on his person or stashed somewhere, and if it wasn't a bank account and he just had it, you know, an ATM card like we all do to access your money, could that be the motive for holding somebody hostage to get access to their banking information to withdraw the money? I don't think that it necessarily means the cash had to be physically there in order for there to be money motive attached to this. Another point in this case that I think would be unfair to mention is the fact that P.I. James, as well as many people in the true crime community, are comparing Dylan's disappearance to an active missing persons case in the same area. Another boy named Aiden Clune went missing in April of 2022. He is also 19 and has a similar look to Dylan, and his shoes were found as well. So if you guys want me to go over the details of that case in another video, I can do that because it just has a lot of strangeness on its own. And I also think Aiden deserves his own story and not to be glossed over while telling somebody else's. But some people are wondering if the fact that both of the boys' shoes were found, could that be a factor and could this be connected? Could it be related to the women whose shoes were taken when they were being held captive? I mean, I definitely have a lot of questions. Could something have happened while Dylan and Kurt were out doing their vigilante policing? Was he possibly accidentally shot and then put in the back of his truck, causing it to be pressure washed? Why did Dylan lie to his mom about Chase and seeing him on the road that day and not driving him? Why was there so much divide with Candace and Justin's side of the family? Does the fact that Dylan's parents were the last to find out about their son being missing say anything? Did Dylan's parents know about his lifestyle and not approve, causing Dylan to want to live far away from them? It's just so much. And I got to give a shout out to one of my girls in Discord who helps me with a lot of this research. She made a chart here to kind of organize some of the possible suspects in this case and some of the possibilities that are being looked into and alleged by this private investigator. Okay, here we can see there is Chase Venstra. Could he have had something to do with Dylan and just made it back to that pizza place in time to be seen on camera for an alibi? 
Could Dylan and Kurt have gotten into a lover's quarrel or had some sort of relationship issues? Could Troy have Dylan captive and be doing something to him, like what he did to those three women, allegedly? Or could Don be a disgruntled employee who was fired and had a bone to pick with Dylan? And there are just so many more possibilities, even more than just this. Now, the only person missing on this chart who I think could possibly, possibly be added onto the list, maybe, just in my opinion, would be either Kurt's wife or daughter. And the reason I say that is because we know that they have said that the marriage was in distress and crumbling because of Kurt's extracurricular activities with Dylan. We also know that Candace said when she got in the truck, she did not need to move the seat up meaning that whoever was the last person to drive it must have been short, similar to her height, and she is 4'11". So could it have been a female driving the truck? Could the wife or the daughter or somebody like that have been so angry with Dylan because he wrecked their family, their perfect family, and could that be a person also involved? So let me know what you think, but I want to kind of just loop that in as well. So that's where we are right now with this case. And I know it took a really weird spin there at the end, but I think it's important to include all of the information that's going around. And you know the saying, there are always two sides to every story and then there's the truth, right? I think that somewhere in the information that P.I. James has gathered must be some truth in there. He is a reputable private investigator and has solved lots of missing persons cases, regardless of what people say about his personality or even his delivery. He has definitely not been the nicest to Candace, but I think his passion for wanting to solve this crime has made him feel like she is wanting to preserve her son's reputation more than actually finding him. I don't think I believe that, and I do think Candace really wants to find her son while also protecting him while he isn't here to defend himself. Obviously, I think that outing anybody's sexuality is wrong, but in this circumstance, I think James felt like he had to do it, to bring to light what was actually going on in Dylan's life and to see the key players. Usually when someone goes missing, the first person they look at is the significant other, right? So without this information, how do you know who to look at? But I think somewhere in all of this mess is the truth, and I'm hoping it's found out before it's too late for Dylan. I'm really praying that he is still alive out there somewhere being strong and will get to return to his family and share his truth of what's happening. His parents just said in an interview that he had big plans for his land, and I hope Dylan gets to see those plans through. If not, I hope the truth is found out so that justice can be served for him and his family. There are just so many red flags in this case, from the amount of people on the registry that live in this area, the people that Dylan was hanging out with, the lack of police involvement from the get-go. The FBI now has finally gotten involved with the case, and Dylan's camper as well as truck have been seized finally for evidence. A little late, and obviously the investigation was not handled correctly at the beginning by law enforcement, but at least it's happening. I'm sure in the next couple of days and weeks, we're going to get more information about what is actually going on here, and I will be keeping you guys updated. On many true crime channels and on the Facebook page, which I will provide information for, the conversation about Dylan, the family, and the PI is getting pretty heated. So please keep opinions in the comments below civil. I know some people love the PI James and some people hate him, but I do think that the information he has could hold a lot of value. And at the end of the day, he and Dylan's family want the same thing, which is to bring him home. Like I said before, little goes unseen in a small town, and someone somewhere knows something. Dylan's parents are offering a $20,000 award to anyone with information that leads to finding their son. So guys, in addition to sharing your comments below on what you think is going on in this case and who you think may be responsible, take the extra 5 or 10 seconds to copy the link to this video and share it. Share it on Facebook, share it on Instagram, share it on TikTok, share it in your text messages, share it somewhere, anywhere, because the more this gets out there, the more likely it is that either somebody will come forward with a tip or that reward fund will grow because people will donate to it and then that reward will become enticing for somebody to spill what's going on because we know money talks. So guys, please share this video. And again, let me know below what you think. I think there could be so many different people involved. I think that, that, again, it's just way too much of a coincidence, the story Kurt told versus what is allegedly in Troy, his brother's history. 
I think that the seat being moved up indicates that possibly a female was the last one to have driven the car. So does that mean that Kurt's family is involved and that they were retaliating for the relationship that allegedly was going on between Kurt and Dylan? Could this all be unrelated to all of these players? And is there a jealous farmer out there who saw that Dylan was successful in land that nobody thought would be successful and they want to jump on it and take over and make money? There are just way too many things here that don't smell right and that don't add up, especially too with that other missing 19-year-old whose shoes were left behind. And again, if you want me to do um, a deep dive on that case, let me know in the comments and we'll do a separate one. We can kind of link all of this together. All right, guys, I'm going to keep you updated. And as I mentioned, there is just so much information being released every day, every hour, all the time. That's why it's kind of hard to keep it straight because there are so many videos popping up all over the place. And that's why I wanted to do one mega big one, a mega pint, if you will, um, of the case start to finish so that it can just, you know, be a cohesive overview of everything going on. But I'll update with more videos, of course, as we learn more information. Thanks for taking the time to watch today and tune in with me. Please spread awareness, share this, and let's hope that we get some answers for Dylan and find him soon. All right, guys, until the next case, stay safe.